know that children are really intellectual beings, right? From the very beginning, they're learning. They learn so much before they come to school. We as a society have actually put a glass ceiling on our children. We would never want to admit that, but we decide what's developmentally appropriate, at which age, and we're putting that glass ceiling on children. We're not letting them go beyond that or stretch their imagination. We don't see children as children anymore. We see them as, okay, they have to be a purpose, they have to be college ready at one point. Now in kindergarten, they do things like teach children how to read and mathematics, you know. That was not exactly or in any way what it was designed for. Friedrich Froebel created kindergarten single-handedly, invented kindergarten, the garden of children, the children's garden. He developed a way of learning before literacy. Play for him is the engine of learning. It's not a curriculum. It's the child. It's child-centered. The child is the curriculum. Today we're struggling with how do we do design education in a K-12 environment. Well, we had that. We had that almost 200 years ago and we've forgotten it. And instead, as a country, we started seeing kindergarten as babysitting. What do we do as, as we had two parents that were going to work? What do we do with our kids before they're ready for school? We put them in kindergarten. What we're raising are a lot of really great test takers. Instead of creating people that are gonna go out in the world and be able to solve problems. I mean, are we measuring truly a child's achievement, or in fact, are we measuring a child's ability to sit still? The best workers are no longer the ones who can best fill in bubbles. Our best workers are the ones that can think creatively. In architecture today, in an age of cybernetics and virtual reality, uh, I think often we're discovering ourselves as makers being distanced from the very things that we make, the processes of, from which they're derived. Getting to know how to craft something um, is just as important as crafting the actual object. You learn a lot of lessons from learning the tools and, and using the tools, and you learn what you can't do and, and what maybe you didn't think you could do, but now you can. I think their work with the Froebel sets is tactile, it's visceral, it's through the skin. It engages their intellect and their mind's eye, but it also, in the construction of the sets, the respect for the material, engages their hands and their bodies. Being physically involved in something, touching something, you just get more of an experience out of it. I also learn very well like visually, our professor John would give us a prompt and we would have 30 seconds to a minute to take our blocks and arrange them in such a way that it would describe the prompt that he provided to us. Some were just kind of feelings and then some were architectural concepts and principles starting from things like hierarchy and repetition, syncopation, taking those and moving on to like sorrow and anger. When John throws out those words, those emotions, those ordering principles, uh, and with the limited time, you don't really have time to, you know, think about this and, and consider all of the different aspects. You kind of just react and, and work with these uh, visceral materials that you've come to know. At first, we had no idea how we were about to demonstrate a bunch of different design concepts with eight identical pieces of wood. Initially, when they begin the exercises, uh, when they're given a prompt, their left brain takes over and they begin to think about how is it that I can abstractly and symbolically describe a thing. However, however, you know, over 20 or 30 minutes, that begins to change. And the students begin to see things for what they are. And you would mess up the blocks again, and you would go at it again to try and figure out how you could use these, these blocks to convey something that's kind of out of our reach in a physical way. 
the foible sets help them to recognize by looking, and they're looking in a new way. It was just interesting how just within these very dimensionalized blocks, everything looks the same. You can, you're able to make such drastic differences in appearance. It really made you think abstractly. I'm also a very concrete thinker at times to sort of be given this an emotion that you have to convey in gift set five, which is cubes. It pushes you to think outside of the box, really sort of try and find like the soul core of this emotion. It unlocks doors that have been previously closed, and it's one wonderful way for them to transverse hemispheres, to go from the right to the left in a powerful and compelling and liberating way for young people, and also discover themselves as potential artists and makers. Given the elements that you have, you should be able to take those and push them to your advantage. And I think that's a lot of what architecture is. It's taking these kind of site physics that you're kind of stuck with. You don't really have a choice of whether or not the sun is a, you know, the way the sun passes or the way the wind blows. And you take these physics and you use them to your advantage. In the studio, there might be uh, their neighbors in the graduate studio looking at them saying, you know, what are you guys doing? You know, why are you playing with blocks? You're, you're big kids, you know, why, why are you playing with blocks? And the students' answers are always so lovely. And I'll use the word lovely because they talk about, well, we're looking at the world in a new way. If we want someone to become creative, the best way to do that is give them opportunities to create. It's a matter of giving them the right materials and the right media and the support to help them learn how to create and express themselves. What I like about Freibel is just how integrated and efficient it is. There's very little stuff in a Freibel classroom. Nowhere near the kinds of materials that Montessori requires. Whereas with Freibel, you have a set of blocks for a three-year-old and the five-year-old will use them, and the eight-year-old will use them, and the 12-year-old will use them, and the 18-year-old will use them. And so over time, the material doesn't change, the textbook doesn't change, but the child changes. The child comes back to that same material with a fresh perspective, and they can bring more to those same eight one-inch cubes and find more and more from that. What did Freud will start with? He starts with, what are we, right? What are we, who are we, but what are we? And we say, he starts with, we are creative beings. We're creative thinkers, we're creative explorers. The way that we navigate this world is through creation, right? Through learning new language, learning how to make up new language. So Freud had this in mind when he decided to invent kindergarten, and kindergarten was really for three to seven year olds. And he said, well, we could teach children how to learn of all things, how to observe and reason and express and create. It's a place where people explore. It's a perfect model. Preschool education is a foreshadowing of the entire educational process from the very beginning. Fribble did it. When I show his practice to art schools, a lot of students are really stuck on the, the 19th century-ness of it and feeling like it is rigid. And I think like for any, so anytime I talk about any aspect of him, I always try to emphasize how, yes, there's symbolism, yes, there's forms, but they continually become something else. They shift, everything is shifting all the time. And that's what's really liberating about learning from him and playing with his discoveries and innovations. It's the same work whether they're three or whether they're 18. From my perspective, the tragedy is that they haven't been doing it since they were three. There's no reason not to. Like, how do we teach critical thinking? Critical thinking is knowing how to think about what's going on. And that's what's happening with the Foible methods. And that's the secret. The Froebel system I liked for a lot of reasons. One, it, it had connections to art and design via Wright and other people. 
Uh, two, it had a concrete repertoire of things that you could play with and use so that it was grounded. It wasn't just some abstract idea that you could uh, talk about. It actually had physical things that you could play with and explore. And three, and this is one of the things that I think is sometimes forgotten, that it wasn't just a system of building gifts, which were the blocks, but it was also a system of categories. And the categories were there to animate the designers so he or she knew how to put the blocks together. My hope isn't necessarily to teach a new style of geometric abstraction, but to bring back the creativity that I think we've lost in education across the board. The gifts are really ingenious when you look at them. I mean, the way the system works and the way the pieces go together and the kinds of things that you can get with simple finger and thumb spatial relations. He's teaching us how to, how to think differently with our eyes, how to think differently with our hands, how to think differently with our bodies, and that these, these tools, whether they're, they're blocks or they're, they're you know, different exercises with paper, folding, pricking, et cetera, um, they're, they're, they're gateways. They're just like a, a way to, to take a, a thought and put it into the physical world, as was gardening, as was hiking, as were all of the other, the dancing, the singing, all of the other things that happened in his classroom. This was just another way to physically be in the world and be creative. He believed that uh, crystals and flowers and children all grow by the same basic laws of nature. It's a form in flux, it's an innovation in flux. I mean, creativity is not, it can't be fixed. Strobel's blocks are kind of a DNA of a wonderful world of design. You know, here's the idea that the children are constructing knowledge through this visual, spatial, physical, tactile, hands-on way. And it's a very powerful idea. He's starting with young children and giving them these experiences, these visual languages, before they're even ready for verbal languages, reading and writing. Learning how to learn, if this were possible, is dazzling. This is what Friedrich Froebel set out to do when he invented kindergarten. I took my son to the bus stop for the first day of public kindergarten in Seattle. I put him on the bus and um, off the bus went and I didn't get a receipt and uh, <laughs> I was <laughs> surprised. Uh, you, you, you spend f five years, you know, uh, keeping your eyes glued onto this small child and then this was the first time where we sort of put him in the hands of the state. And I went to my office, I, I couldn't concentrate, I was distracted, it was a, it was a, a lost day, I could tell. Uh, on that day, it struck me. Uh, kindergarten was on my mind, and the idea that it was invented was uh, a new one to me. Uh, kindergarten was always there, wasn't it? Like, like the air we breathe, you know, inventing kindergarten. You go to many kindergartens today, and you'll see children uh, you know, looking at phonics flashcards and doing math exercises, you know, sitting in desks, filling out worksheets, listening to lectures, and that's not a way to develop as a creative thinker. We know that as human beings we learn in very different ways. Uh, we know that the skills, knowledge and habits of mind that we need to thrive in the 21st century are way beyond basic literacy in, in math and in English. A lot of the things that I think are most important about education are very difficult to measure quantitatively. If you want to try to measure how much is a child developing as a creative thinker, if you want to get a sense of how much is a child de developing their joy of learning, it's not very easy to measure that. Memorize all these facts, memorize how to add, subtract, multiply, divide, memorize this stuff, and they forget the conceptual aspect it doesn't matter if we can do the equation for the isosceles triangle if we don't know why we're doing the equation. But if you have a society that's focused on what it is that can be measured, then it tends to push aside some of the playful creative activities that I think are so important to children's development. In their place come activities which can be measured but might not be nearly as important to children's development. What's worth learning? How is it best learned? 
How can we get it taught that way? And how do we know it has been learned? And those four questions cut really succinctly to the core of the educational enterprise. Curriculum, pedagogy, teacher development and assessment. That the system that we have, in particular the public system, does not honour any of what we know with regards to those four questions. And we value what we measure instead of measuring what we value. We talk far too often in this country about the need for kids to find that love of learning, to find that passion in the classroom. And then we teach them all like it's the same assembly line. Every kid goes about it the exact same way. And if you don't find your passion, it's either your fault or it's the teacher's fault for not instilling that passion. So how can you ask a teacher to establish a learning environment where students can really dig into their creativity and to have that nurtured if the teachers themselves aren't being asked to be creative. There's just a complete disconnect there. Everything starts with the impulse of the child. If I have a college student who doesn't have impulse, I don't have anything to work with. And I have a lot of them because they've been trained out of that. The impulse has been trained out. I'm here to get an A and I'm here to get done and I'm busy. It's the way we were taught, here's your objective, you get that done, then you say, yay, assess it. It can't be done that way. Today we're struggling with how do we do design education in a K-12 environment. Well, we had that. We had that almost 200 years ago. And we've forgotten it. We've almost purposely forgotten it. What's the reason why this Froebel system went away? that um, innate intellectual capacity is getting squashed for the academics. What is all going on? Why does my five-year-old get two hours of homework? It was built for a fundamentally different era. But we live in the information age. And what we need now is people who are educated precisely in theoretical concepts. If we raise yet another generation of children, Within the standardized system, we will only perpetuate and make worse the current situation that we have. The story of the history of kindergarten shows us how we got to where we're at right now. It's just a fascinating story, no matter how you slice it. It's going to be a piece that when people see it, it's going to resonate with them for an unexpected reason. <laughs>